All right, back at work. Next big project. I am going to be building uh, the pilot helmets from the movie Aliens. That is the ones worn by Spunkmeyer and Pharaoh, the pilot. I'm going to try to make them as screen accurate as I can, complete with Pharaoh's Fly the Friendly Skies graffiti. Uh, Spunkmeyer is going to have all the little funky optics and extra greeblies on his headset. This particular helmet here, this donor helmet, is a size small SPH4 helmet. This is the correct model helmet, but this is not the correct model visor. This is a much newer visor that had been on this helmet so that it could accept NVG equipment. Uh, it's really not that big a deal though because once we cut off this portion, the overall dimensions are exactly the same. And Spunkmeyer's helmet has uh, an extra, whole lot of extra stuff that covers the entire front of this. So really the only things we're going to see is what peeks out the side. And these are accurate dimensions to the screen visors. Now I will probably have to sand off this extra material here and then fill it with either fiberglass or Bondo for the parts that peek out. But overall this is really not bad. I can still use this. That is going to probably be the most creative part of the build we do because everything else we're going to do is going to be based on kits. I'm going to get into more details on who manufactures those. They are resin cast kits that are designed specifically this for this purpose to make the aliens helmets. Uh, they are cast off the original parts so and they are very nice and well done. They're not super cheap but you know nothing good is. Uh, we're going to be using those primarily so we're not going to be manufacturing this from the ground up. We're going to need to make our modifications to our visor and of course we're going to need to cut into the material to flatten out this part and get the accurate mounting positions for your Greebly kits. In addition to that of course we're going to need to clean it up and paint it. So the first very very first step is going to be to unscrew everything. Take it all completely apart so that we can clean it. Not just the shell which we'll need to take acetone to probably to get rid of all the glue from the velcro patches and various attachments that have been on this when it was actually in service. But also the inside the liner. You don't want to wear 40 years of sweat, so you're going to want to clean all that stuff out real good too. But uh, I recommend taking detailed pictures or notes on where each screw goes because you're going to need to put them all back when you're done. And to properly clean it and paint it and prep it for the Greebly kits, it's going to have to all come completely apart. So that's going to be step one. When it comes time to decide how you're going to assemble your Greeblies, you've got two basic ideas. One is track down all the original 80s bits from camera parts and from uh, model kits, of all things, uh, vintage model kits. Uh, the other thing is you can just contact Stephen210, spelled with a PH, Stephen, on the Aliens Legacy Forum, because he has tracked down all these vintage kits. He's assembled them in a screen accurate manner, and he has made casts of them and produced the resin kits. Now, the first thing, regardless of which pilot you're going to need, it's going to be this kit. It obviously comes rough like any rough resin casted kit would. I've already cleaned up these parts quite a bit and uh, sanded down the insides. But you need all this stuff. You're going to need some bike hose. If you can get the vintage ones that have the rubber grips on them, that's what these are cast of. I don't know if you can tell that very well. Uh... They don't make them like that anymore. I personally just uh, usually cut the ends off and go ahead and use the cast resin ones and, you know, combination. But you're going to need some kind of braided bike hose. You're going to need probably, if you want to go full accurate, two of these. These are camera control cables from Hama. The Hama brand is distinctive because it's got very fine grips and the overall portion that you turn to thread into the camera is not thicker than the hose behind it. So you're going to need two of these for a ferro style, three of these if you're going to want to do a Spunkmeyer style, and the Spunkmeyer style you're going to need the long 50 centimeter version, whereas the ferro you could get by with two 35 centimeter versions if you wanted. Uh, going a bit further, not everybody wants to go all Spunkmeyer. He had, his helmet had a lot more stuff on it. The base helmet is going to be exactly the same, but it's going to have this rapier targeting sight hood on it and uh, some extra 
Greeblies attached to that. This is another kit offered by Steven210, and uh, he actually sells fiberglass casts of the rapier kit. So all three of these kits are necessary if you're going to want to do Spuntmeyer style, and Steven does them all. Uh, there is a fourth bit that is done by a different member. This is the right side over the right eye optic uh, resin kit. This is the only thing that Stephen 210 from the Aliens Legacy Forum did not make. This came from a member, Jesse DeGraff, uh, also an Aliens Legacy member, of course. Uh, this thing is intricate, and I cannot wait to slap this thing together. This looks a lot more uh, mechanical than, you know, your simple sand and epoxy and fill. They, this has moving parts that will adjust. This is crazy. Very impressed with this kit. Can't wait to slap it together. Uh, it is mostly pressure cast resin, although plenty of metal parts and functional screws in this thing. Uh, I'll definitely get a nice shot of this when it's all cleaned up and assembled. That's cool. Everything is now stripped down completely. Stripped down nice and clean. Well, I mean, it doesn't look clean, but it is. Getting off all that sticky stuff from the Velcro attachments was the worst part. Uh, so this, I'm not going to bother trying to take off the trim. I'm going to just tape that off when it comes time to paint it. Uh, some of the original paint came off. That's not a big deal. We're going to be painting it. Obviously, our correct Brown Bess alternative. Uh, the main thing we got to do now is the cutting and the grinding. It's not much of it. We're going to have a pattern from our ear kit to let us know where to cut out along these portions here. Obviously, since we're making this smaller, we're gonna have to trim down our ear pad cups. So these bulbous areas here have got to get cut down pretty much along the ridge line here to be cut flat. It means we're gonna obviously have to lose our speakers on the inside. It's gonna reduce weight. If you're trying to get a working functional helmet, that may be a problem. Otherwise, losing the speaker is not a big deal. You did not need that for the prop. And of course, like I said, we're going to be cutting down our ridges here so that the uh, overall cover piece that you'll see in a minute can fit over the top of it. So we're going to grind this down, we're going to cut these out. I'm going to show you guys the pattern first. We're going to cut these out right now. Alright, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm going to try this with an angle grinder first. Uh, these are not designed for plastic, they're designed for metal, so I expect it to gum up pretty quick. But I think I can work it faster than with either a Dremel or, if you want to get old school, a simple hacksaw will probably make actually really short work of this. Unfortunately, uh, my hacksaw is not in this building. So I'm going to tackle this real quick. The smell is also bad. This is actually really thick. I don't know. I mean, a Dremel tool with a plastic specific blade will definitely get it. But I'm not regretting my decision yet because uh, so far, so good. out that's flat that'll make it fit of course I'm gonna clean this up quite a bit don't want it all that rough not that anybody will see it not that it's in contact with your skin or anything but just because I'll know it's there gonna lighten that up I suppose you could have took that off before you did this it's not gonna hurt anything but now I got to put it back on but uh, we'll do it the other side and we're gonna tackle the visor we're ready to put in our ear greebly kits. Uh, the good part about those kits is they came with uh, one to one scale templates for you to be able to draw these on to know what you need to cut out. And you will need to cut it out. Can't really attach these onto the round surface. The one thing I will warn you about is that these templates are scaled for the part that holds the kit. Meaning this is going to be a flat plate where your greebly is attached to this goes in here so it's not a true hundred percent scale of what to cut out 
it's a scale of what needs to be exposed once you cut it out, if that makes sense. Uh, obviously, they're also not round, so you can't get a perfect trace. Now, because it's round and you've kind of got to squish it flat, you're going to lose some size, which is a good thing. You want to cut out less than more. Never cut too big. So much easier to keep chipping away at it and make it bigger than it is to try to rebuild something after you remove too much material. So for now, keeping in mind this is a rough idea because this is actually going to be our main plate. Uh, we draw in our shapes. You can reference, um, you know, screen shots. Main thing I recommend to do is find those and compare it to the screw holes, how far these things got to be. That always makes it a little easier. Like my inclination was to make this whole set much lower in the helmet because that just looks too big to me. Uh, but if you look where the curvature start in the hoses, it really is about a centimeter from the top hole of the visor. Of the top screw hole so you know start there and work your way down and of course always 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 cut not enough and then make your base plates out of another material I'm going to use some flat aluminum stock I got to make the plates and then stick them inside and then trim this up to fit your plates we're gonna do that in just a second after we cut out our first hole now here everything is really rough and I have gone and put our shapes onto a piece of aluminum and this is what I was talking about, that this piece that is going to actually have the resin bits mounted to it is what has to fit in here. So now that you've got your solid piece, we can start cutting more accurately around here. Make this helmet fit this is the goal, which matches up perfectly with this template. And one last note on the template, there are some PDF scans of this template out there, especially, you know, on the Aliens Legacy Forum. Keep in mind that most of the time when these templates get scanned, they shrink just a little bit, not much, but um, enough that you should be aware of it to maybe, you know, go a little, just a hair bigger. So I got all my holes cut. I think I got a little overboard here. Kind of broke my own rule. I definitely went too tall on here, so I'm going to have to reconstruct some of that. It's going to be annoying, but it can be done. We're going to use Bondo. Underneath, I've already actually epoxied in my first plate. Used a two-part epoxy. You can use, obviously, anything you want. I've got it against some sticker paper, wax paper, just so that the glue doesn't stick to my table, but I want it to be as flush as possible on the other side. So I've got some weight here on it, and I've got my plate pushed into place in the middle and I've epoxied around the edges. We're going to let that dry. Even though it should come out pretty clean, I'm still going to, of course, put Bondo over the outside of that one. Uh, that one's going to be mostly flush, except for this front corner here. This one is going to be a little more complicated. Because it's going to be pushed up into here with a ridge. We don't want it flush. We do want the ridge there, because that's, uh, that's how it was screen accurate. So. When we epoxy that one into place, we do want a little ridge. And uh, well, then we mount our groobies into that. And there we go. The epoxy is dry on the inside of each. Doesn't take much to give you a pretty strong foundation. And my ridge on the inside that you do need to maintain, there's supposed to be a ridge on this side, is fairly uniform. It may not be as bad as I thought. It's still going to take some effort. But um, this side's looking good. We'll need to clean it up, smooth it out, bondo it, or gap fill it, whatever, not gap fill or foam, but, you know, fill it with uh, putty as, as needed. I'm uh, going to have to fill in this whole area with bondo. This whole thing's got to be a flat cliff face. But uh, otherwise looking good. Ready to start epoxying in our other Greeblies from our helmet kit. Uh, and then maybe even obviously attach these bits, maybe even masking tape this off. And it shouldn't take too long to paint once we get all our bits attached. So we're going to work on that next. All right, rough coat of Bondo's in. Not super rough. I've obviously cut away at it. About five, ten minutes after you put it on is the best time to chop at it because it's soft. Uh, we're going to let it dry overnight. We've got the rough part in. I've also got the super rough part in here to give us our indentation. Uh, clean up some of our edges, flatten them out. Not too bad. It's very, very rough. We need to sand and cut the Bondo down, start installing the Greeblies, and then really 
begin the reconstruction of the top half there. I think this is cleaned up to about where I want it on both sides. Nice and smooth. Uh, finished it off after regular sanding with files and coarse grit with some 320 wet sandpaper. Uh, we're going to let that dry and then we're going to start installing the, uh, the greebly bits. So now we're ready to start our little greebly attachments. These little bits that came with our kit. Uh, if you wanted to find the original Axioid model kits to get the originals, uh, they're certainly out there, on, especially on eBay. Uh, this kit, of course, came with everything we needed. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of trimming involved. If you've never worked with a resin kit before, you need to be aware that very few resin kits come without any work required. They are cast, oftentimes very well. A lot of good details in there. I don't know if you can see them from that close. But you do got to trim the excess. You will need to wash them to get the mold release off of them. And this kit in particular, you may have quite a bit of pieces that get molded as one piece that you'll need to cut free before you can glue or, or epoxy into place. So we're going to start trimming next. I'm not going to make you watch that. That's pretty boring. But uh, it's got to be done. What I've used here is a five minute epoxy. You can probably do some super glue too. There are actually eight different resin pieces that had to be positioned here on this guy. Now I positioned everything around the center mass without actually epoxying it down. What I sometimes like to do is put a screw through it from the inside, especially heavier parts. On this side there's only one piece and I put two screws through that just to make sure that you know you're not going to have anything falling off that's to me way more secure than just gluing something down now you can I probably end going to end up actually gluing and screwing it down eventually but for the sake of painting and getting even coverage in all the little nooks and crannies especially on this area I've uh, left the center mass separate I'm going to unscrew that and paint that separately when I paint everything else here so I still got a lot of cleanup to do on the top I'm going to have to fill in with uh, the side walls the tubes, the bumps that accept the tubes. A whole lot of work to do there next while that stuff dries. Get planning that. All right, so I have epoxied in my little covers that are gonna be the top, smooth out the, uh, the tube section. Gone and epoxied in my first front cable holder and my rear cable holder. We're gonna be using shutter release cables or as a cheaper alternative, something I have certainly done before, a uh, brake line cable. Anything that's braided, st uh, stainless steel, shiny look, that has a clear coating on it, shrink wrap on it, uh, will usually look pretty great. So now we're gonna let those uh, dry up. Another reason I like leaving this removable for starters with a screw instead of epoxying it in right away, because the hose section is three parts basically. This is the base that you need to glue into this. I did have to modify it to get it tilted back. Uh, default in the kit it wants to stick straight up or even out so I had to grind it down so it's you know follows the curvature of the helmet. Uh, the kit came with three of these I'm assuming because if one either doesn't cast clean or you mess one up you got a spare. You actually only need two. So pick your best two. And then for this part any braided hose will work. I used a football pump hose, uh, very similar to like a bicycle pump hose. Uh, the originals were bike pump hoses that had these little rubber things around the screw point. The little brass screw point is cast into that, so you can decide what to do with what you want. I simply pulled out the brass swivel, and I will most likely uh, drill a hole with a rod to slide over it so it stays extra supported. If you want to get real brave, you can actually drill into this. Like I said, the little meeting point there in the middle is cast into it. That's where the two hoses would, uh, would meet with the little rubber thing over the top of it. So drilling halfway through that, you could literally slide this into that if you trust yourself to do that kind of precision drilling without bl blowing through your sidewalls. Um, you can get these little bike uh, football hoses, little hand pump football. On one side's the inflatable needle, on the other side's just a hand pump. Uh, you can get these things for like $1.50 on eBay or Amazon. They're pretty cheap. Uh, finding the original vintage ones are quite a bit tougher. They don't really build them like that anymore with the rubber cover. So you're probably going to need to do that. And you're going to need to decide what looks best and works best for you. Like I said, I did have to modify it to get a backward tilt to it. More visible there. 
So having this piece separate makes this a lot easier than trying to work on it while it's inside the helmet and work within the gaps that the little slots make. So again, that's my recommendation uh, for making it, not attaching this just yet. So I've done some more filling on some of the resin parts in here and sanded them smooth. I think those will look pretty good. Uh, the final finishing touches for the top half of this thing is uh, filling in our, our gaps. Obviously the tubes will come up in here and block most of it. And when it's dark in there, the shadows, it's really not going to look bad if you didn't do this. But it really just looks much cleaner and much more finished if you... Uh, just get some either plastic or some aluminum or something and glue them in there for the, uh, the side walls. Uh, in a perfect world, you'd do them all. You'd have an inside wall, inside wall, wall inside, and then the wall outside here. So you'd need four. I'm probably just going to do the two outer ones because, again, the shadows and the darkness, it's... I don't think anybody's even going to be able to see the inside of here once the uh, tubes are in. So, But I am going to do glue and epoxy these into place and then bondo over the top of those to blend them into the overall structure. Bondoed and putty filled the top. Feeling pretty good about that. Now we are just going to uh, let that dry, give it a sand. You can see the sidewalls a little more clearly there that we put in. Then I'm on to start painting. We're pretty close to being ready to give it our first coat of paint. Then I'm going to reinstall the ear greebly centerpiece here, epoxy the little flappy tab here into that, and then we will finish off the paint as soon as we get the nooks and crannies from the first coat in. All right, I think everything is pretty filled and dried, and I've got my rubber parts taped off. We're ready to do the first round of painting. I say the first round because once we attach our bits after getting into the nooks and crannies, we're probably going to have to use some body filler and go over it again. But we can get started. For most aliens props, a whole lot of them anyways, uh, a color called Brown Bess was used. It's made by the Umbral Model Paint Company. It is a discontinued color. They quit making that a long time ago. They sort of reformulated it calling Brown Bess Super Enamel, which is a different color than the original, which is different than the one used in Aliens. So even if you find a Brown Bess, an old jar, if it says Super Enamel, it's still not quite right. Um, so a lot of people will, you know, go close enough. You can get uh, some airbrush Brown Bess from a company called All Clad. It's closer to the Super Enamel color than it is the original. It's not perfect, but it's still decent. Uh, a lot of times people will try to mix it up using paint chips um, and, you know, just finding the originals and scanning them. Uh, what I like to use is a base coat of Ervo Earth Brown, and then I will use some kind of dark or olive drab over the top of it in a dusting pattern. I'll show you what I mean here in just a minute. So for the most part, I'm going to put down a pretty even coat of the Ervo, and then I am quite literally going to just sort of missed it from a couple feet away and can't really tell from here obviously what's happening but uh, the effect I've already painted up the front visor this is the color that I'm going for this is obviously a finished visor I'm just ready to pop this right onto the helmet so the combination of these two colors will hopefully give me that color because obviously I want to match it to the visor I've already painted up all pretty and we're going to do that now Now when I talk about dusting it, I literally mean a couple feet away, spraying it down. That's what I mean by dusting it. And through the dusting effect, you have neither your brown, Ervo, nor your green. Some lights it'll be a little more green, some lights it'll be a little more brown. And that is exactly the effect we want. Kind of like that color. See if it matches my other one is the issue. So this is a much older one, so it's going to be naturally a bit darker. And I say this version came out just a bit more green. So we're going to have to go in with maybe a little more, a little more brown. Like I say, about two feet away. Just let the mist sort of settle on it. If you get too close. Get too close, then it gets too.
to brown and you got to go back in with the green which you can do there's nothing to stop you from going back and forth a million times unfortunately but you can't hurt it anymore that you can't recover from so yeah we'll see only trying to get this uh, last piece installed because I've uh, put some paint down on everything uh, not everything fits the way I want it to and that's just part of life so I've had to break this off and glue it in more tight I'm having to trim this up because my little wall barrier there sticks out more than I wanted it to everything gets scuffed that's all fine you can either repaint that the correct way however you originally wanted I am probably going to cover up any of these imperfections with maybe a little black and incorporate that into the weathering later. But you know, you got to do whatever you're comfortable with. So now I feel like I am pretty good in the paint department. Using my little dusting technique with my two colors, brown to green and black to darken it all up and give it a little uneven wear. I actually wanted it uneven because anything that is too pristine certainly doesn't look used. It doesn't look like it would be you know in the rotation and service so you do want to weather it up just a bit if you prefer a pristine one that's fine um, a lot of stuff here I had to touch up some of it I did with a paintbrush some of it I did with an airbrush some of it I did with my own mix some of it I did with that uh, all clad brown bess that I mentioned earlier and then hit with some black over the top of it to make it uneven overall I'm pretty happy with the paint job and we're ready to put all our hard parts back on it. I say more importantly, this visor from another project, I feel like I matched the paint up pretty good on that too. This obviously has uh, been kicking around for a few years, so it's hopefully when this gets a few years old, it'll be an even a better match. So now it's time to look at putting all our parts back. That being hopefully you bagged and labeled everything so that you still have everything you took off of it when you were cleaning it. These are the tracks for our visor, our actual visor and the visor cover, the microphone and the various screws and bits that go into there. Of course, your internal ear pads with the outside cups cut off them because, again, we removed a lot of the wiggle room it used to have. So you, if you haven't already cut these yet and cut the tops off them, you really need to at this point. Don't forget to paint your mic tip also brown best or whatever brown best alternative you've decided on the thing that you should focus on is the knob for screen accuracy purposes you're going to want to cut two of the prongs off your knob why just two i don't know it's what they did though so if you want it screen accurate uh cut them sand it as round as you care to get it so i've been kind of uh modifying an existing helmet I had and building a new one as we proceeded through this video. I wasn't sure if anybody picked up on the fact that I had a few of these parts already built, but I did. That's why color matching was so important because I wanted to put my pre-existing uh, graffitied visor cover on the new helmet. And just for a bit of reference, one thing about these helmets, you may notice this is got a lot more distance between the, the nubs and your greeblies. And it's also got about an inch all the way around the entire greebly section. Whereas this one is very short, and yet somehow it only has about three quarter inches. That's because this is actually a size regular helmet, quote unquote regular. To me, in my world, means small. This could not fit on my head. I wear wore a size medium lacrosse helmet back in the day, size large football helmet. Um, this one is a size large. So that's just one thing to consider while you're carving out your bits. I'm not going to try to tell you you need to get one over the other, but it's something to be considered if you have a quote-unquote regular uh, you may need to get a little, you know, closer to the edge than you feel comfortable with. And if you have a large, then you got a lot more room to work with. So just one thing to keep in mind, the differences are very, very, very obvious. And your little templates that come with the kits 
may not necessarily, you know, make you aware of that. And one of the super fun things we were doing with this is if you watch the extra content, I don't believe I'm going to post it on this video, but this is a much, much, much newer SPH4 visor that has the ability to accept the night vision goggles attachments. And it, uh, it's got a lot of extra grooves. And what I've basically done is sand them completely off fill them with fiberglass, then putty, sand, and epoxy over. And while it is far, far from perfect here in the middle, I didn't focus on it because that's what's going to get covered up with your Gunner Copilot helmet. So this sides here is what I did. You can still see it. I'm not going to say it's invisible. You can see where I have done work. It is not perfect. But the point is you don't need the original SPH4 visor cover if you're doing a gunner helmet or a co-pilot helmet you have a lot more wiggle room because you can just chop off the parts you don't like and fill them in it can be done so i'm actually i mean it's not perfect but i am happy with this and i am going to run with it this is what i'm going to use in my personal collection and all the middle stuff is going to get covered by the rapier sight helmet so i ain't even sweating it uh, we are also going to need to install these i've gone and i've cut them so before I glue them into place, between the greeblies here and here, we're going to need to paint the front ends black. Uh, leave this nice and braided stainless style looking good. Also, things that I need to paint black are any fake screws. If they've been cast, then I need to paint them. If they are real, I still need to paint them. So anything where there's a screw, has got to get black. It's going to make it stand out more as an actual screw and sell the effect. There's a couple things here that actually I may want to decide to, you know, grind off and add real screws onto. Or in the case of this earpiece greebly, I'm going to actually want to add real screws just because they're flat here and they've got space for it. So that'll certainly give you a more realistic look to match the screen accurate ones. So of all the parts in our helmet, we actually have had to do very little building or fabricating. We've had mostly kits and mostly existing parts of the helmet that we've just modifying and putting back in. One of the, one of the few things we actually do have to build is this here funky clip of some sorts. I don't really know what to call it, but it's sort of a retaining clip for the wires. Some people have obviously from that picture speculated that it was made from a different boom mic. Uh, but regardless, we're going to make it out of an Airsoft BB and some 1 16th wire. Now you can of course get a little bigger ball, might be a bit more accurate, but the Airsoft BBs are so plentiful and dirt cheap. And I've got some 1 16th uh, aluminum rod here. You could use a wire hanger, it's probably going to be a little bit more accurate. Uh, not just in the under color if it gets scratched, but in the thickness. Uh, I've tried it with 332nd diameter rod, and that's just too thick. The 1 16th is maybe a little on the thin side, but since we got our BB is a little on the small side, I'm going to use this combo because together they're going to probably end up looking really good. Basically, I'm just going to bend it how it is there using some pliers, and I'll show you that in just a second. So the advantage of aluminum is that it's very flexible. The disadvantage is, uh, you know, you can snap it or accidentally cut it when you're trying to manipulate it. But I did get what I think is a pretty passable shape. So now I just got to get a little bracket to hold this on, spray paint the whole thing black, and this piece will be ready to roll. Alright, for my little sheet metal strip through the middle, I've got a spare scrap of some 22 gauge steel. Nice and thin, easy to hammer. I'm going to make a little half inch strip, wrap it around. Spray paint the whole thing black, then epoxy it into place. The prettiest thing I ever hammered out, but um, after a coat of black, it'll it'll go. It'll look all right. And there we go with the black coat of paint. This is looking pretty sweet. I dig it. I'm gonna glue it on now. Not sure how well this is showing up in the nighttime, but I figured I'd take a gander at these two helmets here. So I was talking about the tubes. This is the authentic Hama viewer. 
I've got my piece that I just created taped into place because it's epoxied. I'm going to let it dry overnight. And this one is one I did a while ago using brake line cables. Again, I know the picture's a little bit grainy because of the night vision, but what I want to stress here is it's not that big a deal. If you guys can't track down $30 vintage 80s German made things, get yourself a $5 brake line kit. It looks almost as good. It's a little bigger, it's a little brighter. But there, there's nobody ever going to call you out on this, man. Just use what you got available to you. If you're comfortable with it, there's very few people in the world who can claim differently. So roll with it. It's just as good. And that turned out really well, I think. So now the finishing touches. We got to thread these two things through there. Goodness gracious, I hope they both fit. Didn't make it too small. Should have checked that before. Now we're good. And then we are going to pop these guys into there. I'm gonna fix that and glue them in. And with my tubes finally installed, I think that about wraps it up. We have here is one standard pilot dropship helmet, graffiti painted up Faro style. When I display this, uh, I'm probably going to give it some aviator sunglasses, because how can you not? And uh, this one is ready to rock. Time to finish up the co-pilot helmet and finalize the install of our sight unit. Just touching very briefly on the rapier sight add-on available from Steven 210 as well, if you're going to do your Spunkmeyer bit. Assembly on this is pretty simple. You've got your tracks, you've got your main piece that's one fiberglass piece. Uh, the cool thing about this, I thought, is that in the casting, you can actually see where these original parts where the tracks had assembled, including the holes where uh, presumably screws would be. So I've gone and run with that by just drilling those out, drilling in the holes, also again visible on the inside where the holes would be. And so I'm just going to literally use screws to mount these and not have to worry about glue possibly failing. Uh, nice mechanical mount is always a good option, in my opinion. So as I mentioned earlier, the other side, quote-unquote, of the Hama viewer can go into the top point of the gunner slash copilot kit. Uh, a fun thing here is that the hole is already drilled into this or already cast into this for you to just twist the copilot bit right into it. Now, I don't know if they drilled that out or cast it in the expectation you would put the business end right up front, but uh, there's been a f more than a few of the screen use pictures that let you think that maybe it was the, uh, you know, this side of the co-pilot bit. And that's kind of trapped in there right now, so we're going to keep twisting that out. It's quite a bit longer than it needs to be. And twisting that little uh, knob on there, make it shorter. So you should probably cut this probably about in half. That's what I'm going to do. And of course, you're going to have to paint it black to get it to be screen accurate. But uh, that little hole is already in the Steven 210 kit. So that's one thing you don't have to worry about at least. It's ready to accept that as is. Just twist it on in the way you just saw me unscrew it now. As far as this goes, the Steven 210 kit also includes, uh, you know, the clear bubble there and the lens cover for that. So this is going to look absolutely amazing once we're done epoxying it into place. Personally, I think all my little bits came out a little bit more green than my cover, so I'm going to hit those with probably an airbrush. You could hit them with a real brush, like I was talking about before. The game of touch-up paint is never-ending, and so just don't get too attached to your initial coat because things get scuffed, putting things on, things get scratched, and you discover some things just simply don't match. So you're going to have to play around with a lot. So the best thing you can do is accept the fact that uh, the game of paint is a never-ending struggle. So keep on chugging. You'll get it all matching in the end. To note real quick is you should not have a visor in your co-pilot helmet. 
because uh, it will, will jam up on the visor. It's wasted, you can't use it, everything's covered. So don't bother getting either a clear or a smoked shield visor in this if you're doing the co-pilot style. It's just uh, wasted space, wasted resources. My sight unit is pretty sure it's finalized. Paint the vent black, your screws black. Get your lens in there, the lens came with the kit. This is the kit from Jesse DeGraff. This is the only one that Steven 210 does not do himself. So uh, look for Jesse on either Facebook or the Aliens Legacy. And the only thing that they didn't provide us in these kits, obviously, is, well, besides the Hama cable, which we have also installed into here, is the back straps and retaining device. This is just made from bending a scrap piece of metal. I just riveted in a clip that looks like this. I had it left over from some piece of sporting equipment, some straps. I just riveted one into here on the end. And for the actual strap here, this is one of those uh, semi-stretchy, not much stretch, but some uh, that you have four of that used to crisscross inside the helmet. So I figured I'm going to reuse that because it's adjustable, it's semi-stretchy, and it, it really fits the look. It looks like worn out military equipment because it is. So you cannot beat that. And like I said, you got four of these laying around. You might as well put them to use and recycle them somehow. So I think we are ready to install right over the top. And that is a done deal. It is pretty snug, but not impossible to take off. You can adjust it further as needed. Looking pretty good. I got the last cable tucked in there. And overall, that is a pretty sweet setup. I am very happy with how the gunner helmet or co-pilot helmet, however you want to call it, has turned out. And so together on the old shelf. Spunkmeyer and Pharaoh are reunited. Pretty sweet. So there we are. All done and ready for display. And as always, if you like the video, like it, share it, subscribe, whatever. Uh, on my channel, of course, I'm going to be doing all kinds of builds just like these. I'm going to be tackling props from all over the place, not just aliens, although obviously a very heavy aliens lean. It is my favorite. But uh, thanks for watching, and have a good one.